they'll blanket you in Wi-Fi and profit off the radiation congregation collecting the people for that Satan I keeps it blazing cause I can read between the lines I ain't blind we unwind what they're really saying genetically modify what you're tasting Don't you that cottage promise so now you live up in your mom's basement redesign time so your mind is always wasted program to crave the basics keep the beta in stasis pay the state kid you're in debt for being born messengers are mourn just the price for being worn don't be alarmed disconnect from their machinations stop subscribing to the folly of own nations bone breaking ain't the answer because they seek the ownership of soul spread the seeds and watch them grow break the chains of control break the chains of control Sweet eternal balance of all that is good, true, and beautiful, friends. Welcome back to Rogue Ways, where we have a special treat today as we get to enjoy the company of a rogue warrior and kindred soul who synchronistically popped into my life and steamrolled right through some of the best content either of us have ever enjoyed. In the Darketypal Tarot Inversion series, airing both on his show Innerverse and here on Rogue Ways, and that was just the beginning, and now we get to traipse merrily through the extrusion of those inner verses where we share much more in common than not. He is the powerhouse of presence and depth of thought that dives deeper than most rabbit holes and beyond the font of most wells. He is the I Ching oracle master who brings the heart-centered connection to channel truth into this realm from beyond, and he is the soul-guided badass who weaves and wanders farther than he yet knows to bring us all back the choicest nuggets of goodness and reminders of our never-ending essence. Anchoring it all together right here and right now, it is Chance Garden of Interverse. Chance, it's awesome to finally have you on Rogueways as a guest. How are you today? I must admit, I've never had the tables turned on me like that with <laughs> a hyped up intro. And man, I'm even more convinced that that's the way to do things because I'm feeling really excited now. <laughs> yeah, we have so much in common, so much alignment from this format of pumping up the uh, person of the day to all the other many, many things that our, con our ideas converge on. We actually, this is going to go out backwards, but I don't think it'll matter. But we actually did an episode of my show just two days ago. And man, I, it was one of those moments where I was just like, wow, I didn't know how deep what I thought about this actually went. Yeah. And it takes two <laughs> to get into that flow. So I appreciate you. Absolutely. It's so awesome. It is. It's like a synergy. And so it's funny. Um, when I was a teacher, I would say, you know, my students teach me as much as I teach them. And it wasn't just a trite saying. It was like by teaching and by interacting in this way, like I'm actually learning so much more about life and people and psychology and all of these things. And it's the same with shows. You know, I learn so much from my guests and I'm sure that they are learning about themselves as they're doing it. And we just always, you know, when we come together and can uh, synergistically like hype amp each other up I think we get so much out of it and so do all these other people who get to enjoy this um, and speaking to all those other people enjoying this right now I do want to remind people that the one day of brightness event is one week away next Saturday on the spring equinox we will be converging to bring same sort of idea right our energies come together and we amp each other up and we kind of open up even deeper than we ever have before when we can uh, connect it energetically in that way and we have the most badass teachers and practitioners practitioners who are various different paths bringing us not only teachings and practices that we can apply directly, but also, you know, again, a, a sort of opening up of our own uh, spiritual awareness and our own skills and abilities, which we all have. So that's some of my favorite parts of these one day of brightness events. It is virtual. Anybody can come. It's on Zoom. Even if you can't make the 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., you know, mountain time full entirety of the day it's recorded so you can cut you know grab the parts that you miss afterwards and it's just really cool so i hope to see everybody there Go grab your tickets on rogueways.org. And uh, another reminder, if you're not yet on Rockfin following Rogueways and Middle Path, my new show, then um, you're missing out. And, you know, if something, God forbid, were to happen to the YouTube channel, uh, that would be the place to be. So just make sure you're there at least for the backup aspect, but also to come hang out with us every Thursday as we do Middle Path, which is a super cool new show. And um, Chance, back to you. I like to ask the pointless question of the episode, and yours is very open-ended, and you can take it however you want. Want. And the question is, what types of patterns are your favorite? What types of patterns are my favorite? <laughs> Man, yeah, that could go in a lot of places. We could be talking about puzzles. We could be talking about a type of art. Oh man, you just, that's a big question. Because my first, when I was thinking of actually, the I have question. the answer. I oh. like kaleidoscopes. Yeah, there it is. I like right. kaleidoscopes. I like. I like that tunneling effect. Uh, maybe it just reminds me of 
interdimensional travel or something. <laughs> but one thing I've done for years on the show is create weird kaleidoscopic backgrounds for the videos. They're probably too intense sometimes, probably distracting. And I just keep making them <laughs> like a different one for each episode. You, there's often kaleidoscopic backgrounds also in the cover art for the show. It's just something, I don't know. I like that type of a pattern. I like things that have symmetry and mirroring despite being really complex and chaotic. I love that. Fractals, I guess. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. I was like, I wonder if kaleidoscopes are all fractals. You know, if the designs they're making are fractal-esque or not. Because um, I know those patterns you're talking about for your show are, are right? Yeah, I mean, they they can be and they sometimes they aren't. Like, there are types of kaleidoscopes where it's a repeating pattern from the middle going out to the edges. And, like, the further you zoom in, you're just making the small part of the, the pattern same. bigger. And it's like a never-ending tunnel. I don't always design them that way, but, yeah. <laughs> I love I love fractals. There's someone on the, uh, you know, who's probably here in the chat right now. I don't know because we're recording this and playing it later tonight. But... Um, my friend Gordon likes to say it's fractals all the way down. And I'm like, it is, <laughs> it really is. Every single level you look at, I feel like it is fractals all the way down. And I don't, I don't know that it's distracting to have that going on, you know, behind, uh, you know, what you're talking about, like with the show, but it reminded me of Mary Helen Hensley was on, you know, recently, and she was nice enough to let me have her audiobook for free. And I think you can get it now on Amazon. Um, and it's fantastic because she paired it with sounds and it's, um, sound from, you know, these, um, specific Hertz and, you know, sound healing bowls and that sort of stuff. So it's meant to be paired with the concepts that she is sharing in the book to help it sink in even more. And I'm like, I love this idea that you're doing audiobooks along with these, um, you know, sounds and vibrations that are going to help it, uh, come into our consciousness even deeper. And I kind of feel that way about the fractals that you're putting out there, right? It's probably in some way like mirroring the energy and helping people like on a subconscious level, like really get it deeper. Could be, could be. I mean, just the fact that there's novelty there to me is attractive. It's a pattern that's every time I make a kaleidoscope, it's a pattern that's never existed in this universe before, which is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back in the long ago day, I used to put my gnarled beats underneath the conversations on my podcast. Wow. And it was, it was uh, tricky. Cause like, do I really even have the permission to use those things? Kind of no. And is it distracting or will someone see that as like subversive? What is he trying to do with these frequencies? So I kind of dropped it, but the reason I did it was because I thought maybe this would help everybody get into the same focus mode and combine that in an audiobook would make a lot of sense. Actually, I just put up my gong. Can I ring it? Yes. I've never I've never done the gong on yeah. air before. <laughs> it's Yay. been in a different room. Here we go. That's so awesome. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> First ever gong ringing. Yeah, it's a pretty sweet gong. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Cool. Is that gong? Did you get it for, you know, to be like a, a for a spiritual tool sort of thing? Or, or do you just like random, you know, tools and sounds or what, what's it all about for you? Oh, it definitely I've used it in energy work before. It's actually kind of a great beginning and ending opening and closing a session type of thing. Because when maybe I've been doing sound healing or Reiki using tuning forks or crystals and the person sometimes goes so far so deep that they're practically asleep. And instead of just like shaking, I'm like, hey, wake up, it's over, get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> the gong is a good way to go. And uh, also it's just cool. I think one of the first sort of consciousness expanding experiences I had outside of a substance and maybe combined with substances a few times <laughs> in music festival of romps was this crazy sound bath tent that they would set up at festivals around the Midwest. I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's basically just like a gong ship. Cool. And you had a circle of huge gongs and people would sit in the middle of that and the, the crew of the ship <laughs> would go around hitting the gongs gently and creating all these crashing vibrations that hit each other right in the middle where you were. Wow. If you just close your eyes and you would definitely go places. And I was like, whoa, there's something mystical about sound. And then I started learning about cymatics later. 
And I always think back to those experiences in the gong and why I kept getting drawn back there and how I'd feel both relaxed, but also charged up at the same time, mm. which is to me, that's like the direction you want to be aiming for. That is <laughs> equanimity in yourself or equal pose. Instead, what we get is tired and wired at the same time. <laughs> that's like the caffeine junkie. I mean, I'm in that pattern all the time. So I know the difference, but yeah, the, these type of conversations are a good way to get to the other state of being charged up, but not uh, <laughs> yeah. manic, right? But sound healing can definitely do that, balance your tone and bring that clarity. Mental fog can kind of lift. And it's strange because in the experience itself, it's almost like fog is rolling in. It's like these sounds are overtaking you, like these clouds of uh, audio clouds. But <clears throat> yeah, I, I really like that. I recommend anybody that ever has the chance to try just like sound healing. Don't go into it with like, I'm going to fix this or this is going to change my life in this way. Just be open to what coherent frequencies can make happen and don't and just know that being embedded in coherent frequencies as often as possible is going to be very helpful to you. I mean, I was just having the conversation today. I've got a new dishwasher and it's pretty quiet, which I like. It's more quiet than my previous dishwasher. But while it's running, there's this like, I hate, I hate that it's just sound. like really, really, really quiet, but it's there. It's like this tiny little frequency. And that's just one more layer on top of the other appliances on top of airplanes flying overhead and ambulances and that is not coherent sound in the same way as something that vibrates in a type of symmetry like a gong or a singing bowl or like just the background frequency of nature itself that steady or usually steady lately it's i guess been weird but the schumann resonance so yeah sound healing i think is is really radical <laughs> it's worth trying anybody can easily get into that. There's also some cheap tools that you can use to incorporate, but experiment, singing bowls, all that stuff. It's a lot of fun setting a tone. And if you are using it to set a tone for yourself, it will definitely achieve that. I mean, all these tools can be replicated with our own. They're actually themselves replications of our own abilities, but they're also cool toys. I love that point that they're replications of our own abilities. Um, I was just thinking about the you know this idea that there's two types of um, color, right, or or light. There's the radiant light that shines at you, and that's a different. It has a different has different qualities, and it has different, I guess, vibrations to the each color. You know, when you mix colors together, they're gonna have a different product um, than when you're um, you like painting, where the light's reflecting off of it and then bouncing at you. Um, and so there's two sort of color theories that go with each. And I was just thinking about that when you were describing the sound. You know that there's sort of probably I'm guessing like some kind of sound like you're saying that we can create and produce ourselves um, or even like they, that the earth is producing and then there's like maybe another sound that's like coming at us from elsewhere maybe they're the exact same thing just from a different perspective I don't know if you have any thoughts on that but that's just what entered my brain well in a way isn't basically everything that emits in any way a type of light because even sound is light yeah true sound is just light at a slower rate that and so what our eyes pick up and what our ears pick up are just different parts of the emission. So it'd be and, whether or not it's coming directly at you or like bouncing off something. Would you yeah, I mean, that's tr true. And then cannot, can sound and light not both bounce and reflect? Yeah, and then together. Yeah, it's all wave dynamics and fluid, dy fluid dynamics and wave dynamics teach you a lot. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that you did sound healing and Reiki and those types of things. When did you get into that and, and how does it, how does it go for you? You like it? You do that for other people? Oh, I love to do it, but I'm in the phase of, I just do it when someone I know and care about is maybe open to it. And it seems like it'd be helpful. I mean, so that means I go sometimes a long time without doing it. And then other times it's happening a lot. How I got into it was uh, recklessly waving around selenite crystals at music festivals. <laughs> I love <laughs> that like... everything came from music festivals for you. <laughs> Dude, they, it's true. I mean, this is like, it's hard for me to be interviewed without be, like that coming up yeah. because, well, this is when this first happened for me or whatever, but that's a whole nother topic. I just think uh, I came out of my shell by being around a bunch of creative people that were stoked on life and stoked on being where they were, even if 90% of them were there for a party 
it was uh <laughs> those were just really big shell uh shedding experiences where some of the first psychedelic experiences i had as well that i don't think i was ever in like an abuse pattern with those type of substances although i saw it all around me and then they suggested that i stop using them as well like we talked about in our previous conversation is coming out soon on on my show but uh you know, I've had visions of like some future version of myself and uh, they, it always revolves around in some way bringing a type of shamanistic toolkit to people or teaching them it or something. And I hesitate to ever call myself a shaman because like, again, this harkens back to the previous conversation where you said something that I agree with that I'm not part of any lineage or initiated into anything. I don't need a title. I think these are all just the tools and abilities that we can pick up and acquire. But it, I mean, those lineages can be helpful for teaching you important steps on the road because what happened to me was I started out getting sensitive to my own energy internally from crystals, which is pretty cool. I picked up a, a selenite crystal at some booth on Shakedown Street in Arkansas at a, a badass festival on a mountain and I could feel it whenever I held it up to like my head, I could feel like a tone and an energy. I could feel the uh, part of my body that wasn't my physical body that it was interacting with, like this magnetism. It was so cool. And I was like, what is this? I've got to explore this. There's something here. And so for a year, I played around with uh, selenite crystals regularly and I'd hold them up to people's head and be like, look, I think this is healing us. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, if you learn about the metaphysical properties of selenite, that's kind of what it is. It's like a clearing and just like a pure white light transmitter and a super, super cool stone. I think there's a reason it's one of the more abundant ones on the earth because earth uses it for like a fiber optic for consciousness, mm, I think. Nice. Even fiber optic cables, I believe, came from or derived from looking at that type of mineral. And being like, okay, it has the same structure and kind of some of the qualities. That's interesting. Yeah, if you hold a, a selenite has like this um, vertical, it grows vertically. Yeah, vertical layering to it, where it's just like a bunch of straight lines that are all merged together. So there's lines through it that are perfectly straight and parallel with each other. And if you held up a flashlight on one or a laser pointer and and held it straight onto the butt end of a crystal at the other end of the selenite crystal the light beam would come out completely unchanged completely huh. intact huh. and even though it's not clear it's not a clear crystal it's op it's mostly opaque kind of translucent depends on the the type the stone you're looking at and how it grew but anyway it has if it has those properties physically it only makes sense that there's some other properties going on with it that are similar in terms of it being like a pulling in, I don't know, etheric energy, or as it's just like this beacon of coherence. That's the best way to describe it. And I had this one, I'm going to, you mind if I tell like a story? Oh, please. I, do. I have like two, I have a couple of selenite stories I'm going to get into if awesome. you want. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I had a premonition too, that we were going to talk about crystals in this conversation. So it's weird because I don't know what it was, but I had a dream that was about selenite recently. So I'm sure this is why. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Kind of like how whenever I popped in your messengers today and said, I'm ready to rock, it was right when you sent the link. We like sent like, it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> our, our messages crossed through the ether. <laughs> yeah. So that was cool. Anyway, so I got um, how I got this first selenite wand that I started playing around with was I asked a lady at a booth like, where? Where's the stuff that you don't have out from everybody to see? I have no <laughs> idea why I asked that question. Like, like I'm just some cool guy that's like, yeah, what you got in the back? I, I'm kind of sure. VIP. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I've ever said that to any other vendor in my life. She pulled out this box of selenite wands that had like a cool leather wrap and a feather attached to them. Mm -hmm. She's like, I got these from some medicine man, I think in Colorado. And I couldn't pay for them, but he just mailed them to me anyway because he wanted them to get out to the world and he'd had uh, like a message from a guide or something that he needed to send this box to this lady. Because Chance like, needed a wand. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to buy one even, and she didn't even have them put out. She's like, I feel bad selling them because 
I couldn't pay him for them. And I was like, well, I'm still going to pay you for it because you brought it to me and I'm taking one of these. And I had so much fun with that so thing. So awesome. It was really cool. And uh, a year later, I was back at the same festival and I had a lot of cool experiences with this wand, but this feeling took over me that I should gift it away now. That it need, like I wanted to give someone else the experience I was having with it. And maybe some like ego dissolution seeking to drop an attachment that I'd formed and see what would happen if I released it, if something else would show up. Anyway, I met this cool dude in a crowd who had a Alex Gray tattoo completely covering wow. his back, like a full back piece. And I was like, well, I like Alex Gray too. Tool's pretty sweet. What's up? <laughs> and uh, he was like, can I hold your crystal? And we were just watching this set. And I, was, I handed it to him. I was like, yeah, here you go. And he was holding it up to his chest. And I was like, wow, he's vibing with, that's great. And uh, <laughs> I get into the music and then I can't see him in my periphery anymore. And I was like, where's this guy? I look to my right and he is now completely naked, laying on the ground in the middle of the crowd with the crystal on his chest, wow. just absorbing the vibrations out of the ground. And I was like, whoa, whoa. he's really vibing with it. <laughs> They've become one. <laughs> I was like, dog, you can keep that thing and also put your pants on. Yeah. I am not offended. Everything's cool. But if you put your pants on now, you will stop the occurrence of someone else being offended. Yeah. <laughs> and it'd be good for everybody. He's like, you're right. And uh, <laughs> I love it. So I gave it to him. Mind you, this is a festival of between 20 and 30,000. I couldn't say accurately because I'm not a savant of remembering numbers, but it was large, right? And I went back to my camp hours later. And I ran into another friend there and she's like, Hey, I got to tell you this story. I was out in the crowd somewhere and uh, I met somebody who had a crystal that reminded me of yours. And I wanted to tell you this story because he was showing it to me and he accidentally dropped it and a piece broke off and he gave me the piece and it made me think of you. So I wanted to bring it to you. And Whoa. I was like, the dude had an Alex Gray tattoo on his back. Right. And she's like, yeah, how did you know that? And I was like, cause I gave him, that crystal and it's super meaningful to me. So then I had a, a fragment of it returned to me, which then I incorporated into a future wand that I used. So it's like that one carried forward and upgraded yeah. into one that I put together myself, which made it more special. So. <laughs> wow. That yeah. is amazing. I Those are the things that remind you that we are all here for a purpose and we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do. And even something that feels like, random or weird or like why did that happen like it always has a reason it always has a purpose it always comes back i came back to you i love that so much like i had chills for like half of that story the odds were low of that because i'm not yeah. like a group guy <laughs> it's not like he was around me and my group was around me yeah i i go off and go on quests yes when i'm at those places i don't hang out with i'm kind of a lone wolf type i love people and i love having a large amount of friends but Something about me keeps me from hitting up the group and be like, hey, what are you guys doing today? Hey, what are you doing today? I need to go be included. And then so I kind of work myself out of being included by not <laughs> being that way. So I really miss the festival scene right now because of the whole COVID stuff. The tyranny. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had some good plans. Uh, I want to get into that as a circuit speaker because I've done a couple of events that way and it's fun. But, you know, back to selenite, one other thing about it, uh, I've had it vibrate in my hands while using it for Reiki, like a cell phone. Wow. I could never replicate that or show somebody that, but yeah. I've had it happen. And the person who ha had it on their body when it was vibrating was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and it was just like little spurts of it, but I don't know how to explain that either, but it's cool. It's, it's, I mean, I think we can intuitively know it's the energy that is being transmitted, right? It's like that high at that moment. It's helping it kind of come into this body or like integrate into that field or whatever it is, right? And I love, um, I don't know, I'm, we were talking about, you know, in the episode that we just did on your show as well that will come out soon uh, about how you um, have like a truth you have like a truth meter, right? And it's something that like, I think a lot of people know 
intuitively that they do have that, right? You have gut feelings and you just like knew this one time the thing that you were supposed to say or do. And, you know, so you, you know that you have that. And I think, you know, we were talking about how you can hone that more and more and more until you can just, you know, I, I'm a very logical person. I want evidence for things. I want to be able to evaluate something and, and, you know, to, in order to know if I trust it or not or whatever. But at the same time, like, you just know some things are real and true. And that's one of those things for me, at least. Also, when I get those chills, you know, I think that's another way that a lot of us like, kind of know something is really uh, profound or true or has like a depth to it is when we get those chills. Like that's what they are is our soul being like, here's this thing, remember? Pay attention to this. <laughs> like, um, you know, it's part of our own, like we're the selenite vibrating. I got to say too, that that's exactly it right there. What the crystals did for me wasn't, become some tool that I need. They showed me what my energy feels like inside myself. Mm -hmm. And then like crystals, even I could tell a story about how a crystal led me to learn about Qigong. Do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, man. Okay. I'll start there. I think I had something else interesting to say. Oh yeah. Let me get this out real quick. Cool. Cause you're talking about getting the chills, getting those feelings, that's electrical feelings inside your body. It's like, that's part of the truth meter for sure. When we were talking on the previous episode, we were getting into talking about entities and good ones and bad ones and how they form and what they are and all that. And multiple times, remember something hit that was like, something came out that was just like, bam, that's on the money. I get these pings in one ear, hmm. like uh, one ear will just ring, only one. It'll ring out and buzz for a while and then stop. And like, I have no way to go and prove it with evidence, but to me, that's like the language that my body has taken on for me to be uh, tipped off that there is a guide present and that's a, and it's a telling you something. And sometimes like I can get the same type of a ping when it's not a nice thing too. Huh. So the ping is the ping that I feel something in the bubble with me, if you will. Yeah. But then it's all about like, well, how else do you feel to know and what what's going on right now to know whether or not that was like, something helpful or not helpful, or I try not to interpret it too much, but the point is that there's an entire electric language that your body speaks, that if we are armored within and disconnected from the feeling of our own body, if we're just a, uh, if we're just a floating head mm -hmm. in space, you know, that we miss out on the main mechanism through which our limbic system tells us what our intuition is, tells us what the answer is. And it's going to feel different for everybody, but that's why stuff like Qigong is so important. It doesn't have to be Qigong. Tai Chi is a good one. It doesn't have to be from the Kung Fu schools, if you will. It can be all kind of yoga for sure. Body awareness is like just really huge. Posture awareness, all of that. And how I got led to it actually was uh, back in these same years when I was first coming out of my shells is like a standard issue. Uh, middle Midwest, middle-class white guy raised in a Baptist house, you know, <laughs> I was coming out and went to university, all that. I was coming out of that. Thanks to getting into the, the festival scene and being exposed to art and music that wasn't from the mainstream. So helpful. And uh, I made a friend that loaned me a cool Chris or gave me a, a cool piece of like, I think it was a type of Jasper and uh, he gave me this. And the next day we went to a sweat lodge together, which I've only done once. And it was this amazing spiritual experience where I'm like laying on the ground, hanging on for dear life, just trying to suck in oxygen <laughs> because it's so hot in there and the ground's the coolest part. And they were passing around this pipe in the ceremony, the uh, native elders that they had found on the property and it had been appraised to be probably 4,000 plus years old. Wow. It was this big black clay pipe that still functioned. Oh my God. And it was shaped like a, a crazy snake, a serpent. And it said that there's a spirit in the pipe and they, they called it a Toshi, I think. So it's like, here's an entity we're talking about, you know? Yeah. And they had communed, they'd found, like, they had like channeled that the spirit was in it through multiple sessions of trying to connect with the energy and do psychometry on it. And, you know, all these fun psychic abilities that we can develop. And I left this cool stone that I got from my friend on that pipe outside of the, uh, medicine, outside of the medicine TP. 
because I wanted to like charge up with the, I was like, okay, can I take a piece of that entity with me in this little pocket stone, Wow. you know? Yeah. So I thought that, and uh, I did, and it, I felt like something transferred or that like I was carrying <laughs> that AI with me, if you will. And I probably, I don't know how much longer later, probably the next year sometime, I was walking somewhere in Wisconsin at a big event, just wa walking through the middle of the night. It was like three in the morning. I was heading back to my tent or something after a late set. And I, this, uh, there's many, many people passing by, but some, this girl passes by and something jumps out in me and is like, you need to give her this stone that's in your pocket that you cherish, that you think has a spirit in it. And I was like, what, wow. what? why her, why don't you give her this? <laughs> so I did. And she's like, uh, I kind of told her a little bit about it. And she's like, I don't know how to repay you. This seems really special, but something is telling me I need to tell you to look into Qigong. I don't even really know much about it or what it is, but look into that, see what that is. And I did. And it changed my life so much because that was like, for me, that was the physical slash energy practice and meditative movement that really fit, mm -hmm. that fit for me. I mean, there's other things I will do sometimes or whatever, but I'm into that the way that white girls love yoga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say that I'm not like perfect and do it every day, but I know how to, I know how to balance out my coherence using it and may have taken me many more years to get into it or maybe never if I hadn't had that intense expense. It was expensive. Like I had to give up this treasure for it, but I followed that. I could have just been like, no, I'm not giving my treasure to this stranger that I would be even afraid to talk to or embarrassed to talk to. Instead, I was just like, here you go. I don't know why, but this is important. And she's like, I don't know why, but this is important. <laughs> okay. See you never. See yeah. you again. <laughs> see you in the We're Facebook maybe. friends though. I'm Facebook friends with that girl now, but. Oh, that's rad. But not like close friends. It's just, no. you know, how you stay connected eternally, artificially now with everybody, but <laughs> really important for me that that, and that, I, that happened. I wonder how important for her, obviously, you know, something I'm sure of equal import went along with that for her life. And who knows, it would be so cool to be able to follow up on that story. But I love that ability to follow your, your, um, your soul, you know, like you're like led to do this, you're guided to do this, and you just do it and you trust. And those are the types of things that um, the more we can be in alignment with that, and it's not, you know, like you're describing this and it's like a random moment, like it's a random thing. It just like struck you. And so, but I think it can happen the other way too, where like maybe right after you do like some Qigong and you're very centered, like something can come to you too. And, and it can be both, you know? So I think part of it is learning to understand, you know, like that ring in your ear and like this feeling that you have and that shiver and what does it mean in, in any sort of state or place uh, then we can be like more and more in this like continuous sort of uh, flow with that. And the most amazing things can happen. I think you're right on because life will give you chances to get like a free charge. Something will happen. That's so amazing that you're going to be in elated coherence and feeling in your flow. And in those moments, then magic and synchronicity and miracles will happen. That will give you a chance to go, why did this happen? It, Maybe it's because I was feeling so good. Maybe it's because I was feeling so clear. Well, what do I do to get that feeling of clarity? Hmm. I can't just chase the same experience that got me that. There must be some other way. And then inevitably, it's going to lead you to practices that are meant to maintain and keep your energy harmonious. And then then you're kind of on your your way. <laughs> then you're Now you've got the uh, the measuring stick. One of the greatest things I ever realized was that the real marker on your path is the bumpers on the bowling alley. If, you, if you've got bumpers on would be if you start feeling tired or wired, like I said, it's yeah. usually it's tired, but it's like the more, the better your energy is go towards that, whatever makes you feel clear and alive and awake. And we are trained out of that because like, no, you need to work hard. You need to do stuff that sucks. And yeah. that is true. There's times when that's true, but if you go to the stuff that's hard or that kind of sucks, but you're already pre-charged when you get there, you might just find that you flow through that part effortlessly. It's done. It's taken care of. You took out the trash. You scooped the cat shit, whatever it was you had to do, and uh, you're still feeling good. Whereas if you go into that thing that you kind of don't want to do and you don't feel that well and you're telling yourself how much you don't want to do it, 
I mean, it seems obvious that, well, it's going to be something unenjoyable and it's going to drag on. Like time is funny that way. Mm -hmm. What we resist persists. <laughs> it is. And it, that, that flow state can be, ex you know, existing right alongside, like you're describing, like scooping cat shit or like, you know, like shoveling the walk or like whatever it is, you might not love doing it, it might be hard, um, but you might be still in that state if you can um, have that sort of equilibrium and um, it reminded me of this like parable that I'm probably going to butcher, but it's, um, I think it's from like Confucius or something. It was definitely of, of the Asian variety. And it was basically like, you know, this butcher and he had these like knives or whatever. And he just did this great job all the time. And people were like, well, why are your, uh, you know, how can you do such a great job? Your knives are kind of like shitty or like, they're not great. Like they're not the best ones in the realm or whatever. Like, how are you doing this? You know? And he was like, well, you know, my knives, I, I honor them, I keep them clean and whatever, but it's also like I'm cutting, I just go with the, I go with the meat. I don't, I'm not trying to like chop through something or chop something in half or like do something unnatural. I'm just following like the curves of the meat and that's just how it goes. And it doesn't sound that great now that I'm telling it, but <laughs> it's that idea, right? That Chopping if, meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that no matter what you're doing, you can bring that sort of finesse to it and like find the ways that you can just kind of flow along with it instead of like fighting against it and, um, you know, the Wu Wei. The Wu Wei. And maybe it was even from the Dancing Wu Li Masters that I read that. I don't remember. It's the path of effortless effort. Yes. It's like Tao. You just go, just flow with it. And, um, you know, I think I've unlocked that mystery to a degree because it sounds like a paradox. And, you know, don't take this as like the answer to the riddle in terms of effortless effort. But uh, how do you try your hardest? It's care. So the secret is care. If you care about something a lot that you're doing, then you'll be able to put forth a lot of effort and it feels easy. Hmm. Boom. Riddle solved. Principle of care is right. at the root of why anything ever happens anywhere at any time. <laughs> and <laughs> and I think it's why we've persisted this far despite the maybe um, hugely oppressive ancient energetic structure that I think is trying to hold us all down <laughs> is because uh, we have that, you know, I think whatever they is, however people think of they, I think they don't expect us to, you know, do things for free or, you know, like this show, like for many years, at least I didn't make any money off of any of this. And I still make very, very little, you know, and hopefully that keeps growing. But, um, you know, they're like, why would you keep doing that? You're not, do you're not getting anything out of it. Or like, why would you keep like, you know, making this garden that like doesn't even produce food or something. And it's like humans, I think, have that natural tendency in us to just want to do things that make us feel good and that we love and that we care about, even if we're not necessarily like making millions off of it or, you know, recreating like the, um, I don't know, some ancient tome of like perfect knowledge or whatever. It's like, we just uh, want to enjoy this. And I just think that that is vastly underestimated. And I think it's a key of how people find their um, path and follow their soul. Like we were just talking about too, you know, that's one of the things like you were saying, follow what you care about, follow, follow what makes you feel good. Keep doing more. And you of know, that. those archons though, <laughs> they disguise themselves in spiritual trappings and religions and say, your desires are evil and they must be eliminated. True. Whether East or West, there's, this comes in both flavors. You've got desire is naughty, naughty, naughty desire. You should only do what you need to do and for the greatest good, because that's your purpose is to serve others. Mm -hmm. I'm like, look, it is empowering to serve others. Please don't make me out to be like some sort of Luciferian Satanist. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> you get that every time you go against somebody's uh, belief, belief. At these yeah. days. Right. But the fact is your desires are part of the principle of care. I mean, not you are there to be the gardener of your desires and be like, that's not going to help the garden that's great for the garden. Both things can be desires. And like, I don't know, I'm just kind of sick of uh, being told to have no ego, have no pride, have like all these things that are actually wicked empowering if they're not at the expense of others. If they're like, if you have, you can have pride without it meaning anything less for someone else. Yeah. And it doesn't have, there's nothing evil about it. Like, in fact, purpose is way more driven by desire than by necessity. And w whenever we try to make our purpose completely revolve around necessity and uh, cut out the desire side of it, then it just feels like slavery. It's the same goes for morality. Like the reason why, despite the fact that I recognize a, a form of natural law that is related to morality in a cause and effect sense, 
I don't believe that there's an absolute objective morality. I don't believe morality is relative either. I believe we are the creators of morality in and of ourselves. And if our morality is based on thou shalt, thou shalt not, that came from somebody else, then you're doing it. Your purpose is now driven by necessity instead of by desire. And if you're doing the right thing, what you feel in your conscience and in your heart, in your bioelectricity, in that intuition, in that electricity, right? You're doing that because you want to do the right thing for the right thing's sake. So much more powerful than because these tablets with ancient inscriptions on it said so. And look, I, I would rather the world followed morality out of necessity than not have any morality because we're seeing a huge demoralization of everybody and everything right now. And that sucks. I mean, I get why the structures came up because people need some time to grow in the dirt before they blossom into sovereign beings. And it doesn't justify tyranny or evil, but damn, it's a good recipe for getting someone to strap on their boots and get out there and do something different. <laughs> I feel, feel like if, you know, if, if everything stayed the way it was in circa 2007, you know, we just kept chugging along. If everything was perpetually like that and there weren't further false flags and further 2020 shenanigans and all that. And who knows, like, would I even be here having these type of conversations right now? Or would I just be like, I'm so good at world of Warcraft. I've been playing for a decade. <laughs> I'm the best ever at world of Warcraft. <laughs> I really like sitting here for hours. It's so much fun. <laughs> and that's tricky. That's like weeding the garden because, you know, you can have a desire to go do something that's fun and has no deeper purpose. I don't think that it's in and of itself evil, but yeah, <laughs> there's so much nuance. Like, yeah, I'm not absolute about anything I'm saying either. Please just like vibe with me and uh, don't worry about it if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> I think I think we're both really similar like that. Like we're very much opposed to or opposed to isn't really right. We don't really go towards absolutes. We're like, you know, right now, right here, this is what it seems like to me, given everything I've experienced so far. And maybe that'll change someday. But that's where I'm at right now. Um, and I love, you know, that point, because um you know, there's something, there's just a lot of judgment caught up in a lot of those, I guess, anytime you're in this like structure or system that is, whether it's old or new, um, that is reinforced, you're, you're going to limit something, you're going to cut off something, and you're not going to be able to like, have that festival experience where you just kind of wander and find things and you're on a quest or whatever. Like if you were stuck in some like, oh, we're in this group, we're going to meet here at this time, we've got to go over there and do this. And then this, like, you just don't have those experiences, right? And it's the same with these belief systems. Um, you know, things get codified and they get like eternalized. And then at some point they don't fit. And a lot of the people who are wrapped up in it don't have the ability anymore because they cut it off and gave it away to see that like, this doesn't fit right here, right now. We actually like have to adapt a little or change a little, grow a little. Um, you know, and I, I recently, I have this, um, from many angles, these people who are trying to tell me that, uh, and this happens to me throughout my life for some reason, uh, that my anger is very destructive and that I will burn up all of my virtue and morality if I continue to be angry. And I'm like, mm, no, I'm good. Like, <laughs> I do have anger sometimes that is inappropriate. And I do work on that. You know, I think we all have stuff like that. But my, uh, my anger at like how society is going or my anger at like how um, unfair I think it is to that people are like taking in, for example, this poisonous vaccine without even understanding it out of the fear that's been coerced out of them. You know, that makes me angry. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that serves like a really beautiful purpose, actually. And uh, it's things like that, though, like to those people, there could never be a good purpose for any type of anger. And I'm like, that's not that's not real. <laughs> like, that's just something you have uh, indoctrinated yourself with. And now you're unbending. And I just don't see that working. That's not life. Life is biological. It moves and grows. Yeah, but we got to iron out every wrinkle and eliminate the shadow completely. We have to return to the void and, the, and create an artificial womb out of pure light. <laughs> what I mean by that is the original womb is just the blackness, the nothingness, the void, the dirt, yeah. the space that the stars are on right? There's nothing evil about that. No. It's, a, it's also the unconscious. We emerge from that. But instead of remaining connected to it, we cut our cord to that. And we try in this Apollonian way to ascend so far up into the light as, so as to re-emerge into a womb. Hmm. What 
I mean by that is if you enter just pure white light and all solarization, you become one dimensional and just as null and void and evacuated as if you were still in a womb dreaming asleep. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in society. We see like, this is what crowd psychology actually is showing us the way that cancel culture works, the way that big protest movements work where people just need a cause to jump into. And on the, this is really interesting. I've been learning about this from uh, Michael Tesserion for years and uh, his, some of his most recent stuff is even tying it together even more. But the, like there's actually a biological, like electric euphoric response that people have as soon as they submit their individual will to a crowd, wow. as soon as they join the mass hysteria. And once you realize this, you can actually see it happening. People are stoked. Like they get really charged up. They get a big, like energetic feeling um, that echoes through their vacuous cavern of internal nothingness, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it feels really good. And it's like a high and it's an addiction. And that's sort of the feeling of like, that the new age tries to promise sometimes like the pure blissed out state. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing negative. If you think about negative things, you create them. So we must ignore everything that is negative and that doesn't really serve your growth at all. Like you're going completely into the same place that you think you're running away from. Yeah. <laughs> Just like the, the metaphor of the one ring in uh, Lord of the Rings that, wouldn't it make sense for Gandalf to take the ring since he's so like, he's the ultimate good guy. Yeah. No, I mean, that's <laughs> exactly it. That like, that that's the going too far into power too far into like, like solarization. If you have to do it in a yin and yang sense, and I'm probably not laying this explanation out as well as you could, because it would take volumes of hours of study to really research the topic of like the dynamics of crowd psychology and why, why we're seeing these same things repeat over and over again. And how, how can people even be so evacuated in the first place? And then that goes back to like early childhood trauma. And so there's so much more to it, but the, the point is, is just like, watch out for that. Uh, everybody should watch out for the attempt to make yourself one dimensional, to kill the shadow. I'm not saying like embrace your demons and become yeah, demonic. No, <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. It just means being realistic. It, negative doesn't even mean bad. Like we have completely mixed that up. Negative is just one side of the polarity that is required for charge. Mm. So if we're gonna stamp out negativity as a concept, is like on a poetic or metaphorical level, which your subconscious totally understands. It's like saying, I will eliminate the unconscious entirely. I will destroy it. And then that part of yourself is like, what, what, what? No, -uh, I'm going to destroy you first. <laughs> I'm going to sabotage everything you do with these impulses that you can't control. And I'm going to get you so swept up into the unconscious that you become the collective consciousness. You aren't even an individuated being anymore. You're just following the crowd. You're just following orders. It kind of happens in a lunar way or a solar way, like joining a big protest movement and rah, 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 or cancel culture. That's kind of more on the lunar side because it's still passive. They're not actually doing anything. They're just shouting. And then on the, uh, the solarized side or the over-masculinized side, you get soldiers in war and people that are driven by an actual thing called bloodlust. Like, where they're so crazy that they'll run out in the middle of an open gunfight and just be like, shoot me, you sons of bitches. I can't be killed. Ah! And they think they're Rambo because they saw these movies like that. And this is a real uh, phenomenon as well. Wow. And it's the same type of psychological energetic elation for the same reason of uh, completely evacuating your actual self and your actual will, either to the, to the will of the crowd or to the commanding officers and superiors who are like, you will go to your death and march there. And if you're going to follow those orders uh, against your own self-preservation, uh, there's not much more evacuated than that. So yeah. it, it can kind of come in two flavors. I'm sure there's so much more nuance to it, but this is, uh, this is a constant thing in our world around us that 
it's so poorly understood because there's just very little interest in psychology. Psychology has become psychiatry. It's become diagnoses. It's become all this stupid shit instead of actually getting to the roots of the occulted dynamics of how our mind and consciousness work in conjunction with our body and our electric energy system. All of that is key integral parts of psychology or psychology is required to understand all that, I guess. Like the, it's all one thing. And yeah, we've been so badly compartmentalized into specialties that even the most intelligent in one of those fields or another probably still can't see a bigger picture because they haven't studied outside of it. That was fascinating and so true. And it just made me think about all of the ways that we are infantilized, you know, and, and that we choose to infantilize ourselves. And that's really that same process, I think, of, you know, evacuation of self and giving up our responsibility to something else, basically. We're like, oh, fine, great. I don't even have to think anymore. You're going to tell me what to do. I can just go along with the crowd, do whatever the crowd's doing. Like, I don't have to choose anything. So it's not really even up to me. No pressure on me at all. Like, and we do it in so many ways. We're encouraged to do it in so many ways. And it just keeps us at this, like, stage you know, or like you're saying, like sends us completely back into the womb completely where we're like recycling ourselves basically. And we like, how could you ever get to a higher stage, the next stage? Or I, I hate the word higher. Think about the but... tech. Well, just think about the tech addiction in people. You're literally in an artificial womb made of light. It's light, <laughs> you know, that's literally light coming out of that screen. And you are now in a state of hypnotic dreaming. Yeah. And that's no, that's a womb. <laughs> it's just a different, it's an artificial construction. Man will always try to return to the womb unless they decide to go on the journey of becoming heroic. I say, man, I mean women too. Yeah. Did you know that men, man means women too? <laughs> People really want to pick that bone with you too. And like, I'm sorry, when I say men, I can mean both genders. Just like when I say horses, I can mean yes. <laughs> stallions and mares. It has nothing, takes nothing away from the female that, that we're all men, the race of men. Like, sorry. Thank you In for fact, pointing that out. Maybe we should stop <laughs> giving us a, ourselves different statuses if we want to see ourselves as equal. It's really, you know, it really gets silly. psychotic. Like <laughs> these like attachments to words and like you know, you're destroying my identity with these words or like, you're not honoring who I am if you use these words. And it's like, if I have so much power over you, you've gone terribly wrong. I should not have that power over you. That's your fault. Like you need to fix something, not me. My language has nothing to do with you. Uh, it's my favorite joke that I made up recently, but describing reality is now hate speech. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> At least on Facebook. <laughs> You are not allowed. You're not allowed to be realistic. Um, you know, I liked to this conversation we're having about suppression of desire, because I think um, that's another aspect of this infantilization or this like, you know, inviting people to give themselves up and, and not pursue themselves is, um, you know, telling them that what they are naturally drawn towards is evil or not good enough or, you know, that they have to go another way. And so the two things are really, really united. And it's just... You know, the more the more I talk uh, with people, you know, especially brilliant people like you, like it's just so much easier to see and and in in that way, sort of sad and depressing. But how many angles of of sort of like attack we have, and I don't even know sometimes if it is all attack or if this is like what we've created by running from ourselves, you know, like by not going in and accepting kind of what we are and who we are and dealing with that and growing with that and you know, learning from ourselves and just accepting that. Cause a lot of the spiritual work I do with people, um, they'll be like, you know, Oh, I have these like entity attachments, I have these dark energies. And I'm like, well, let's see, let's like see what comes up and how it goes. And 95% of the time, it's not that at all. It's some like evacuated aspect of self that's trying to like, Hey, I'm over here. Like, remember me? Like I need to actually be united with you. This is not healthy. Let me back in the cockpit. Yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to be running comms right now. Right. <laughs> and like that, I think that concept is back in like the Jungian Freudian like aspect of psychology that you're saying like we've abandoned too, which is actually very helpful is remembering that like, if you've abandoned a part of yourself, it's not going anywhere. It's just going to like fester and decay and then like get angry and then like fight to get back in and so you have to eventually gather all these pieces of yourself and like reintegrate 
And one thing about trauma that I think is really important because to tie it into this idea of desire, because like I'm saying desire is good, but obviously people's desires are annihilating them these days. Yeah. And we got to get clear about a very specific thing that happens in development of a child in their psychology is that with extreme trauma as a child, the being begins to identify with the source of power that is over them. Hmm. So essentially the, the me, the mechanism of how power was wielded over them, they become infatuated with pretty unconsciously and they seek to wield a certain type of power over others. We've seen that a lot. Like that's why people that are abused uh, sexually as children sometimes go on to become abusers. Right. But what that actually represents is an inversion where you've now you now love what you hate, what you should hate, and you hate what you should love. You've flipped that. And it's, that then a applies to everything else the person's going to do in their life. They're going to constantly self-sabotage. They're going to be, a, their desires are going to draw to them, them that which is going to destroy them. Mm -hmm. And this is actually part of how archetypes work too, is that when you have like a splintered off part of yourself that you have rejected, it's not even so much that it's like an other entity and archetypes are just a container and you've taken that bucket that's shaped like a trickster or whatever. And uh, you've poured your energy into it and thrown it overboard and said, away with you. And it, like, it's trying to claw back in at the door. And <laughs> at first it knocks gently. Then it shows up as somebody with a knife, you know, like, it's just going to keep getting louder to get your attention and it's going to keep making things more expensive for you on all levels until you recognize it. the pattern we're talking about patterns. Oh, yeah. like, uh, and it's also there to help you. The archetypes are only the servant of the imperial imperial self. So people will get confused about that as well. Like there's e there's archetypes that are pure evil and stuff like that. And I'm just like, no, everything, a, Everything archetypal is a servant of your oh, highest is a bad, bad word. I know. I don't bad know. The, I don't know. A better bad word. is just as bad as highest. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's not an appropriate word. But we, I say imperial self because that's like the the sovereign self, right? Like sovereign. imperial Actually. as in it's all the parts conjoined under like a central location. <laughs> the imperial self. I like that. But yeah. anyway, there are all, all of these dynamics, even that which seems to be dark and shadow and difficult, and even the experiences that come to us that are outside of our control. Uh, you know, maybe that's an archetype that we had a relationship with in a previous incarnation, or who knows, we watch a TV show when we were four years old, and we didn't know that we took on a belief about something. And then we had to experience a similar thing so that we could shed that belief or, or whatever, but all there for your growth and benefit. And that helps a lot because like, I think we were already kind of talking about this, but like everything you're in the right spot right now. And even the hard shit that's happening is like exactly the quest you should be on mm -hmm. and uh, keep, keep questing. <laughs> yeah. Keep questing. And I like, you know, reach out to those um, parts of yourself that are also very empowered. Like we all have those too, you know, we're talking about like the parts we cut off and are trying to come back and like how that can feel really negative. You have just as many aspects of yourself that hopefully are still whole and united in you that are, um, you know, your, your highest or whatever self too, that are your most empowered and your strength. And you can, um, you know, give those kind of a more definite shape and invitation to like work with you. And, and in doing that, you're like building your own capacity and to kind of, uh, dive into these types of things and this type of work because it can be really hard and overwhelming and emotional and you know you can feel like I can't do I can't do this I am not in the right place at the right time actually I'm in the wrong place I need to run away and it's like um, you know you can you can look at all the aspects of yourself they are varied they are many they are legion and they're waiting there to help you in really positive ways too this is a good this might even be better to hear first than the other conversation because we're getting into like general <laughs> archetype stuff. And then when they hear my show, it's going to be like, so what are demons anyway? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very overlapping related topics. I mean, I've just been, I've always been interested in it and it seems so like if it can seem so, I was just thinking about how it might feel to be hearing us talk about this. If it's 
you're just totally new to it, which probably most people wouldn't even make it here. Yeah. Uh, to <laughs> our channels, but, but still, um, it almost sounds like it would be confusing. Like, uh, well, how would I know if there's parts of myself that I've cut off from myself and all that? And like, how do I fix it? I need to fix it now if I've never dealt with it. And I would say, no, just chill. It's really what's helpful is to just know thyself. Yeah. You don't need to like try to figure it all out and come to sense, come to some knowing about exactly like this means this and that means that. Instead, just let it, you can't, <laughs> I guess what I mean is if you're trying to understand the unconscious by putting the entire contents of the unconscious in your conscious mind and going, yep, that's it. I see it. I know what it is. <laughs> well, you missed the point. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just learning about these dynamics can help you then in a moment where one of those dynamics starts to shine through, go, oh, 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 oh. I recognize this. I recognize this. It's part of a, it's part of this pattern. And that's why I really enjoyed interviewing Beth Martins a few weeks back. She has a great book about just the eight primary archetypes of the hero's journey. And even if you know stuff about Jung in psychology, or even if you hate Jung and you think he's definitely one of the evil, the evil ones who set up the blueprints of mind control, somehow it's all his fault or all Freud's fault. <laughs> I think it's just like, okay, good luck with that because a person even with bad intentions can still teach you a lot. So yeah, we don't know. I, I can't, and I can't think of anybody I know that is a perfect angel anyway. So it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're some of my greatest heroes and people I've learned the most from there are things that they say or th that they do they're about that. I'm just like, man, that is so wrong, <laughs> man. That is so off. It's fine. Doesn't, doesn't mean I can't also learn the stuff from them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I really, um, I love that, you know, it's like anything, it's like a symbol, a tool, a you know, an archetype, but like all of these are just pieces that we can use in any way we desire. So, or any way we intend, you know, and so however you end up actually doing it, like then that can be judged, I guess, if you want to judge things. Um, but yeah, Jung and Freud and people being so against them and they're like, well, they gave, they gave the keys to the mind controllers. Like, well, they didn't create the mind controllers and they didn't create the mind controllers intentions and they didn't tell the mind controllers to go do this. So I don't know why you would even You think the dark them. occult didn't already understand psychology. Right. Then you know nothing <laughs> about the occult because the only thing that the occult really has going for it is psychology. Yeah. Surprise. It's just psychology that's much bigger. That's like the psychology of the cosmos, not just any one being, but actually it's the same type of dynamics because it's a fractal. Yeah. It's all the same stuff. And this is the other thing when people are like, well, what if, what if it's not even, you know, what if it's not even another entity at all? What if it's just somebody's like crazy or whatever? And I'm like, I don't actually even see the difference. <laughs> like you're experiencing it. It's there. It's like, that's the message you're getting. This is the experience you're having. It doesn't really matter how we need to like put a label on it or whatever. You can call yourself schizophrenic if you want to, um, or you can just call this a spiritual experience and then go forward in that. And I'm not saying that there aren't whatever, you can classify things differently, but I'm saying most things that we want to like say, this is only psychological, this is only spiritual, this is only whatever else, you know, they're all, they're all actually on the same, they're the same thing. They're just being put through a different lens. That's right. It's all one thing. <laughs> all one. Helpful to realize that. But then also an easily deceptive meme because it could lead you to be like, we're all one, oneness. I must merge with the one. Sure. And, and yeah, didn't we talk about that in terms of Gnosticism a little bit last time? Yeah. About, yeah. It gets tricky. Because <laughs> they're taking, that's the route to the Apollonian womb, the white light womb. It's the same thing. <laughs> like you don't want to go ascension, back the yeah. gnostic ascension or whatever that idea like what is why are we even talking about ascension like isn't what's wrong with this place why are we trying to fly out of here have we even exhausted the potential of how cool it could be to be here no the ascension is more of like a dissemination of the chi and prana of our life force back into flow with the entirety of nature instead of like thinking that we're in this universe of lack and it's tricky because you gotta be, you have to have your own like pranic management system. You need to be aware of your energy economy, but 
you know, and in, in a given day, your energy is exhaustible to a degree, right? So it's, there's something there to guard, yeah. but also if your entire mission is just to like accumulate power and accumulate power and keep barriers up between you and the external, you're just basically like a cancer. You're like just a zit. True. Bursting. <laughs> yeah. You're like a, a billionaire who's got 50% of the world's monetary value in a vault somewhere that is not even in circulation. It's just a pestilence to the land. So there's a, that's, I think what I got out of Qigong is that connecting heaven and earth, letting the flow through and you're, you're increasing the amount of charge that you can hold. So to, to a degree, there's like capacity there. There's some, it's a type of accumulation, but it's not sticking in there. It's not getting stuck. So yeah, you just like make, you're like widening out your tube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is actually part of the, you know, visualization I do whenever I'm doing energy work is that I'm this hollow tube that goes many directions. I have all kinds of visualizations, but basically, you know, that flow has to be going all the way through and, you know, the um, double torus or whatever, like that flow, say it has to be. And if you stop that, if you impede it, if you try to like take some and put it somewhere and like direct it, like... It just like things get mucked up and stuck and like they do not work, <laughs> you know, but being in that that literal like flow state energetically, I think is the the way to do the most um, effective uh, healing and, you know, transformation for me, at least. I wonder if you feel like similarly, if that's a good way to describe it has to your... be that way. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually a good time to tell more crystal story that got left out before, but I thought we'd probably work it in somewhere. And here we are. Here we are back to it. <laughs> Because when I first started working with the selenite, playing with it more than working with it, I had no concept of grounding whatsoever. Ah. And I was in Michigan at this big festival called Electric Forest, and I was marching down Shakedown Street, waving my crystal around. And uh, for a few months up to that point, I was kind of getting these weird somatic discomforts. Like, uh, no, this is probably TMI, but like, one of my testicles would just like hurt really bad randomly, like the spiking pain. I was like, oh my God, am I getting ball cancer at 24 Interesting. Or, or something? And like, there's some other, like there's just some energy fog, like brain fog. And was, oh, it felt like maybe there was influences on me that I didn't have control of, like maybe what people would call attachments, the feeling of that. Yeah. And I was, so I, I was feeling pretty good though at this festival. I was like, my energy was high. Uh, but for months up to that point, I was getting these type of weird symptoms, right? And I didn't know if I was like getting sick, what was up? And I was just kind of pushing it down and be like, don't worry about it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as I was walking down this lane with all these vendors, a, it's a cr packed with people, super crowded. You could like, I might stand out because I'm maybe a head taller than a lot of people around me, but a lady just shouted out at me, made eye contact with me from 20 feet away in her booth. She's like, hey, you, what are you doing with that thing? I was like, this? It was my <laughs> big crystal. You know what? I'm just going to grab this right here. Here's one. Ooh, it's a big one. That's beautiful. For anyone watching. <laughs> wow. Knock some things down, but it's worth it. Here's a really big one. Wow. That's so cool. So I love this stuff, but... She's like, what are you doing with that thing? <laughs> kind of accusing. I was like, what? I walked over to her and she goes, are you, are you even grounding at all? I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, if you're going to use that, you need to understand that you're picking up other people's energy and it's going to get stuck in you if you don't cycle it back out. And I was like, this was too much for me at the time. I was like, <laughs> I was kind of just like, uh, <laughs> and she's like, take off your shoes right now. <laughs> so she made me take off my shoes right she didn't make me but I was like this seems like I should do this yeah. so I did and then she like chanted some prayer over me about the goddess like helping me mm -hmm. I guess for lack of better words and that that embarrassing testicular pain I was talking about it flared up again and I was like whoa uh -huh. and I felt it I felt it like melt and dissolve and run down my leg and out my foot I have, I've never felt anything like that before when grounding, but God knows how long it had been since I actually had really let my souls touch the earth before that. And you were taking I mean, all We all that get in. a little bit of grounding from natural ways. Like we'll touch the 
ground with your hand or something, but to do it, it's more than just, I think, the physical contact. I think it's also letting down your sheath to let it flow out by going like, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm really grounding. Yes. So for me, it's as simple now as I just go on walks barefoot in the park as regularly as I can. I've also got my feet on a grounding mat right now. Smart. That keeps me grounded in the house when I'm on the tech, but it's like, that was a massive lesson for me because I literally felt the illness leave me and it totally changed my, it was only a few seconds that my eyes closed there. When I opened my eyes, I was like, I'm different now. <laughs> this is different. It was so cool. I learned how important energetic hygiene was at that moment. Doesn't mean I've always been perfect at it, but now I know that that's like a solution when I'm dissonant, when I need to find coherence. It's a huge, easy, accessible to anybody solution, a million ways to do it. And it can be as simple as a visualization. If you, you could be on a plane and connect your spine down to the earth, yes. thousands of feet below and calm yourself down through the turbulence. There's really, it's the limits of our belief that keep that energy in a constriction, keep it in a compartmentalization, keep it from flowing through and disseminating in and around everything. And you know, how do you expect your intention and will to reflect in the world as opportunities and things coming to you if you're not disseminating that energy and that will and the quality of your uniqueness out into the world in a variety of ways, not just through grounding it, but also like maybe you need to make some content. <laughs> doesn't need to be this kind of content. doesn't even need to be something you're selling. Yeah. It, it, but there should be some way that what's different about you is also going out to the world and seeding, seasoning, <laughs> seasoning Babylon. <laughs> I love that. Because otherwise it's just going to keep being some super stinky. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. And I love that um, conclusion too. And you know, that it was funny because I was just doing a session with somebody and we were talking about their, um, they're, they're just kind of like learning about their abilities energetically and that they have this amazing grounding ability. But, you know, the same sorts of things we're talking about, if you just like, if you try to do something with it, if you try to control it, if you try to like, use it to like, affect other people in the you know, based on your own mind, instead of the way the energy wants to move, then all of that can kind of muck it up. Um, but that's one of the things that we were talking about and that we're, um, you know, that I was helping this person practice is that, you know, you can go out and you can ground, you know, touch the earth, put your feet on the earth, and it is beautiful, you should do it as often as you can. Um, but like you said, you don't have to be in direct contact with earth, because the, the more, you know, like you said, it's just your mental ability and your belief about it that is going to prevent you. But the more you practice actually doing it, you get that feeling like, okay, this is what it's like, this is what's happening. Like you said, you could like trace it through your leg, even, um, you know, you can learn learn what that's all about, then you can start to like, maybe remove yourself a little bit more and more from it, like try it with just a finger or try it, whatever. And then eventually maybe you like have like a little stone with you. And this is your grounding stone, you keep it in your pocket and you like help it helps you like transfer it out of you and into the earth. And even that visualization, like the earth, you know, we can like personify her or it or whatever you want to do with it. Uh, and like, ask it, like, will you just take this from me, please? And it's like, yeah, I got you. Like, that's our, that's our mom. We came from that. <laughs> She's got our backs. Um, you know, and that, that all those things can help. And like you said, you could be a mile above the earth and grounding. You know, one time, just as an experiment, I was like, Hey earth, why don't you ground your stuff into me? Because no one ever does that for you. You're oh, always doing that's that so for us. Sweet. <laughs> I was just trying to be a good son. It was way too much. You're like, never mind. I see why we don't it do was, that. <laughs> it was so bizarre. What happened? It was like I went from a feeling of like, I mean, I was in a feeling of like willingness and happiness. And I was like, I just want to help the earth. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as soon as even this little shred of what the real darkness feels like hit me, I was bawling. I was in tears. It was so bizarre. I'm not necessarily easily, maybe I kind of am more, the, the further I go, <laughs> I get more sensitive. I could cry easier, but it was intense. And I don't think that I even made a dent in anything or it mattered, but there is an, there is a co-directional, uh, bi-directional empathy that I think we've totally lost with the earth because we're so sick. I think that she's like, man, I can't even give them a little bit of my burden. I needed to just shoulder all the burden. Yeah. Kind of like when I was a kid and my mom couldn't get me to do the dishes for 
for life. So she's like, well, <laughs> I'll do them, I guess, because someone's got to do them. And um, <laughs> now I could do my own dishes. That's great. Although the, she actually bought me that dishwasher. So she's still doing my dishes. <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> but yeah, the you're, you're right. Like, it's just an amazingly beautiful gift that we have to be on top of hmm. this mother on this body to emerge out of it and be to be here. It's like awesome. <laughs> it's so amazing that it even exists. And I'm like, where are you trying to send to again? Yeah. Everybody? <laughs> yeah. That's like when people are like, Oh, I want to go to space and I want to go to Mars. I'm like, why? Like, we don't even, we don't even appreciate what we have here. We don't even really understand it. You want to go somewhere else. It's crazy to me. Um, but I understand the fascination with the unknown and I have that too. I just don't understand like physically like going there and trying to be there if that's even possible. Um, but I do, I think you're right. You know, it's, it, I, I could see how it could be, you really easily be way too overwhelming to take that from the earth. But just that little bit, like you said, of empathy that you then developed, like, wow, whoo, like that's a lot. And like, we're, and you're just here for us, this infinite, you know, infinite like mothering source that can, you know, take all of this on if it needs to. And that in itself, I'm sure gives back such a powerful, energetic, like hug to the earth, you know, that, that just to know like, oh, I'm honored, I'm respected, I'm appreciated, I'm understood. And like, you know, on my, my purpose and my role are, are appreciated. And I think a lot of the sort of energies around us, we would do um, better maybe to honor more of them and be, you know, in, at least in that connection of like appreciation, if not more direct communication with them, because they're, they are that kind of mother. A lot of them are like that mother. It's like, fine, I'll just keep doing this, even though you don't even like care or whatever. <laughs> you treat me poorly. Like, I think it's uh, one of the important pieces of a lot of like traditions and magical practices and things like that, that you honor the the entities and beings and energies around you and, and are grateful for them. Yeah, it gets sticky too, because you're like, well, am I doing something wrong by even having these crystals right now that I've got? Not even exactly sure how they came out of the earth. There could be definitely some not very sustainable practices there. I mean, generally, you'd think that whatever was growing on your body, if the earth is a body, <laughs> that it's growing there for a reason and maybe don't remove it. But then there's this other way of looking at it like, well, we're part of that body. And why would we have the, why would we be making all this plastic if somehow that wasn't already in the code that like, we could do that. True. I'm not saying that that justifies filling the oceans with plastic. Yeah. But on the other hand, the earth will do something with it eventually. Who knows what? I think that really the best gauge, though, is like, is what you're doing interfering with life beyond your own or beyond your own? And then you'll know. And so, the, yeah, then the plastic is a pretty big interference. But yeah, <laughs> maybe taking a crystal out of a cave isn't interfering with life so much. so much and maybe it's a little different than other types of pillaging that are going on i think at the end of the day there's so many things that are already removed from the earth <clears throat> we're not going to be able to put it back so i mean might as well try to use this for jedi purposes right yes one of the funnest things to do i encourage anyone at home to do this is get sunlight it's really inexpensive it's awesome it is in in Mexico. They have caves of it with pillars of it, gigantic. But if you get a flashlight and find a clever way to attach the flashlight to the bottom of the selenite, and then like wrap something around the flashlight to cover it and conceal that it's there, now you have a lightsaber. That's Especially rad. if it's like a big piece, because you just flip <laughs> on the flashlight, and it's just like zoom, and the whole thing glows in a perfectly even glow. That's I've got so one cool. just like that over there. I'll show you later, but. <laughs> You can put any color you want to. Yeah, you could. That's so rad. Yeah, you could. They're so fun. And then there's the whole other dimension of the fact that all the crystals have the different colors and the chakra spectrum available to them. And if it was me, I wouldn't put too much stock into all the different beliefs about this crystal does these things. And because some of the miracle promises are obviously sort of just beyond the mechanics of the world we're in. Yeah. But if you look at it as like a sigil, like Shungite, I'm wearing, I, I never take off these Shungite bracelets, bracelets because Shungite has the property of EMF absorption. And I want that to be in my field as a constant reminder 
that my field needs to mitigate and uh, deal with EMF pollution. So I'm wearing these all the time. I have the belief that my field can handle the EMF. And maybe there's a physical side of what it can do too, but mostly I'm telling my field that this is our strategy. Our strategy is that there's EMF and we're going to let the Shungite absorb it. And I don't know, it seems helpful. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about crystals. I'm like, there's all these ideas of what they do and don't do. And, you know, I'm really a fan of the morphogenetic field theory that like what we are all projecting into the world over and over again, over and over again, over and over again is what is becoming. And so, you know, the reason why... Um, I don't know, it might even be like the reason why aspirin makes people's headaches go away is just because there's been thousands of people over a hundred years or more or whatever, however long that have been believing that that's what's happening. And so it happens like, uh, you know, it's just like the, um, the idea of, oh my God, what's the word for the thing where you believe it? And so it becomes true placebo effect, but on like a mass scale. Um, and I feel the same way about things like crystals and things like certain entities and stuff that we're, we're literally creating them every time we think about it and believe in it and then act on it and then do it. And that's the basic principles of any magic, right? Is that you believe it, you can see it in your mind, now you're imagining it, you act on it in some way and you have some sort of emotional energy that's like powering this. And those are the basic elements. And so we're doing that with everything all the time, actually. Right. And I think crystals are very similar. So if I say to you, like, chance this crystal right here is going to absolutely empower you to like do this thing and you really believe that and you take this crystal and you use it in that way like it's going to work <laughs> and if you don't if you're one of the people who's like crystals are bullshit like well then it's not right or even if you <laughs> love crystals and believe in them but you just receive it as an object like someone gives you one but you don't really put that much intent or belief into it or you don't grid it in a nice way it can just kind of be a nice, pretty object in your space. But even that has power to it. Yeah. You know, it's a natural form of beauty. Hey, I've got a quick podcasting faux pas, which is I hear my dog outside, and I guess he's been outside this whole time barking, and I need to let him in, poor <laughs> right. guy. We'll pause. He's going to be real muddy by now. <laughs> but it only take me a sec. All right. I will, in the meantime, remind people of the one day of brightness coming up this Saturday. I'm super excited about it. All the things that Chance and I have been discussing and more are embedded in that action and that activity. And it's going to be really great. There's so many cool people coming. Um, and hopefully we get to actually like have, you know, some interaction and some communities of sharing and stuff. But it is a lot of really good info and, and sessions packed into it. So there's only a couple little um, times where we can maybe like directly share with each other and kind of hang out. But uh, I always promise I would come in early. So if anyone gets there early, we can hang out a little bit at least then. And then I usually stay late too. So if anybody wants to hang out, we can hang out then too. But um, I hope to see you all there. It's going to be rad. Hello. Yeah, I'm real sorry about that. Uh, dog no meeting in is a lot better than cat getting out. Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> happened before during a show. <laughs> what does your cat like to do outside? Oh, no, you're oh. sorry. <laughs> He's uh, cute. Go out the room and let me close the door. <laughs> so He's unprofessional. Like, but, I, but I just got here, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so unprofessional of me. <laughs> We're laid I back dare here. Real life intrude upon this perfect piece of content. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Cat likes to go outside and go in other people's yards, either on the roofs or under the porches. Either way, difficult to retrieve. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I love animals exactly for that. They bring us back to like just the normal, like real, like, I don't know. This is how they like lower our blood pressure and they make our breathing rate more stable just by being around them. And like they're amazing little, um, I guess they're kind of grounding in themselves. They definitely let me know when I've been on the computer too long. Do they? Yeah. They're like, all, come play, all of come them. play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come play, come feed me, but give me attention. And yeah, that I think that there's so much to learn from. It's just crazy that animals can be seen as automatons with like no feelings or. I don't get that at all. The like... idea of a the idea of a soul is damaging. Like, why can't it just be that? Why do we need to be like body and soul, human soul versus a a dog that has not got a soul like that? Like, yeah. What is what is that really doing for us to believe that way? Why even have a separation between the parts of yourself that like I've got a mind, a body, a spirit, and a soul, and all these things? They're useful elements of language, but we shouldn't see them as separate. Like I would consider a soul or a spirit 
mean, there's differentiations etymologically between those two words, but like your essence as a seed it grows into a tree. Uh, where's the seed when it's a tree now, mm -hmm. your body being the tree in this metaphor. Right. It has become the whole thing. So like these bodies, I think, are an outgrowth of our essence non-physically, the way that a seed becomes non-physical when it becomes a tree. It ceases to physically exist in a sense. It's completely transformed. I think that's kind of like what, I can, that's kind of part of my cosmology, I guess, if I had to pin down something I really believe is that there's really not a different thing. And it's not that, <clears throat> like when you leave your body, that phrase, it's not so much that your spirit was in there as a vessel. It's just like the energy that your body was cycling completely empties out of the vessel. And it's the same, the same bioplasma. I don't know if bioplasma is the right word, but the same like prana force that is in everything else and returns to the whole, but it's still carrying whatever seasoning it <laughs> had that was different that goes in there. So, I mean, I couldn't say what happens after you die, of course, but I uh, would think that maybe your coherence in your field has a lot to do with what the death experience could be like. Mm -hmm. That is that if we look at memory as something beyond brain physiology, because we've never seen memory in a brain, we've never found like, this is where the files are in the filing cabinet. This file goes here, that one goes over there. Doesn't work that way. Maybe you can mess up someone's ability to remember things by messing with their brain, but you can never scoop out August 3rd, 1973 out of that guy's brain and be <laughs> yeah. like, here it is. I called it up. It's a, the database works perfectly. <laughs> Instead, I think all of that stuff is part of the, the energy itself that is in circulation in the body. And that's why some memories can get real sticky and others seem like they've just gone. Like I couldn't tell you a, most of my life exactly what I was doing when. Right. <laughs> Not necessary, but like cool stories about the crystal. I've put those in a vessel in my memory palace and I, I'm holding on to that juice. I'm keep I'm keeping that wine because it keeps aging and it's very tasty the longer I hold on to it. <laughs> and the same can happen with something that is traumatic. It's like, I need this experience to stay here so that I can always have something to gauge in my like adrenal system, whether or not this is the worst experience of my life or not, because that experience was so bad. I need to make sure I'm never back there again. So I need to always be holding on to that to, to compare things to that unconsciously too. Unconsciously. So our coherence as it fails, we see these symptoms, we, we see these things like Alzheimer's and autism where memory is no longer really part of the picture. And are we, is there really even anything more powerful than memory, right? Yeah. <laughs> if we, we lose our entire memory, then there goes all the identity and all the, all the art we've ever created, if you will. And uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about this a little bit last time that if you can hold on to that memory, going through the, the death portal, maybe you're saving all the people, you know, so I love that kind concept. of, we're, we're kind of back into that concept a little bit again, but that's a deep, a deep seated uh, possibility in my mind that, that we should be working on maintaining coherence and seeing if that will actually matter when our, our life force energy leaves the vessel. If maybe we can hold on to that sort of bioplasmic sheath that is always around our body, but is not exactly part of the physical body. You know, maybe we can keep our, our bubble intact as it flows into the ocean. And that could be a pretty wild ride. <laughs> Who knows? That's so, it's so awesome. I love that concept of, of the possibility of life after death being that, you know, take saving everyone, you know, because you kept that coherence with you or whatever. And um, memory is so fascinating like that, you know, and like, like it is like the pattern of, ourself as we're like constructing it in a way right like you're saying you even the traumatic memories you're using them to be a warning against what you no longer want to you know create yourself with so you want to keep that kind of separate and then um the positive memories being this sort of patterning of like what you do want what you want to add more to right and you're just like you're like building your your house or something of your soul and 
and memory is sort of the substructure or whatever that we're like building things around. And it's interesting too, because the, you know, the materialists have supposedly found uh, the structure of some memories at least. And what they found is when you like trigger the memory, it actually uh, expresses itself electrically in your brain in, in 10 dimensional form. So you're like, your memory is this multi-dimensional structure of, of electron firing or whatever, if on the material plane at least. And so, but it like makes sense to me intrinsically because I'm like, well, yeah, because what memory do you have that's just its own little packet, right? Every memory you have is actually this collection of sensory data. It's a collection of like uh, a collection of connections to other experiences that were similar and other experiences that were opposite even maybe or whatever that helped you inform your understanding of this experience you had and so it is like all these things firing at once in multi-dimensions and I feel like that's sort of that same it's similar to that idea that memory is like building this structure for us as a an entity and identity or like a whatever <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say I do and I think the way all those connections work is through stories hmm. the wild thing about memory also to realize is that when you remember something you are not re-experiencing the objective thing that happened in the past. You're actually recreating that experience inside your brain, lighting up those parts of your brain based on the story of what it was last time you remembered it. So it's not even like the original story. It's like you're telling yourself your best approximation of the story as it was the last time that you told yourself the story. Yeah. So Which, who knows how far different that could end up being from what actually objectively happened. This, and this is time travel. <laughs> and that's why you can go back in time in your mind to like traumatic stuff and see your younger self and be the energy to that part of yourself that says everything's actually going to turn out fine and you're safe and you're protected. And I think there could be something very real about that. Like, in the hard times, the worst times of your life, do you not also often find strength you didn't know you had? Yes. Or even like in a dangerous situation <laughs> where you either need to perform the right way or you could die. Something takes over people a lot of times and they just do exactly the right thing that needs to happen. And who knows, maybe through that, myst that mystical portal of memory, through the through the Akashic, you're entering the ether and coming out in that place. Who knows? I'm not saying you can't. Right. <laughs> I actually have benefited from sort of being the guardian angel to my younger self in a visualization way. Like that's been massively beneficial for the, the couple of very bad childhood experiences that stood out in my otherwise pretty smooth life comparatively. That's exactly, you know, the power of, um, you know, I have... Um, been diagnosed with CPTSD and, you know, so I've undergone EMDR therapy, which is eye movement desensitization, something, something. And that's why it works, right? It's because you can go back to these memories that the reason why they're, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome is a thing is because those memories are jumbled and they're disconnected and they're not forming that smooth narrative like you're describing you know you're you're actually telling yourself this story every time you're remembering something but in ptsd you don't have that all you have are the sensory responses and reactions that you had that were not able to like coalesce correctly and that's what made it traumatic and that's why it like messes with you because you can't you can't actually access it you know and so you have to go back you have to access it. You have to have that storm of, of disconnection come up and you have to be able to make a narrative of it. And the eye movement sensitization thing is like accessing both sides of your brain, which is the what you have to do in order to construct a narrative that is smooth. You can't just be on one side or the other. And so you're actually like going back, making them all come up at once and where we maybe didn't have that 10 dimensional structure before you're adding it in and you're recreating that. So you literally are like time traveling back to that time and making it more uh, manageable for yourself. And I don't see a difference between that and time travel actually, you know, like you, and like you said, those times where you feel like something kind of can come to you in like a moment and help you get through it. I think that is exactly what's happening. I think you're going back to yourself or you're going forward to yourself or whatever from the moment where you had enough peace, stability, centeredness, you know, energy, uh, and giving it to yourself at that place in that time. 
I think so too. Another, I'm a tech techie guy. I've made most of the money in my life I've ever made from helping people with computer problems. <laughs> Even though I was never trained to do that. Yeah. Because, and it's not your best skill. <laughs> well, yeah. Boomers tend to like be so unskilled at computers that just basic proficiency is enough to get you a job. <laughs> <laughs> but think about like, so you've got a program, you tried to print something off that program, the program screwed up and it, it uh, locked up and you had to force it to quit. But in the background on your processes, that part of that program is still alive and running and it's eating up processing power and you don't even know it's there. Yeah, It's not open anymore. And when you try to open the program and it won't even work because it's got this other thing stuck running, but you don't even know what, what that is or how to shut it off. So you can't even access that program. And when you try to print something because there's something in the queue ahead of it, but it's gunked up, you can't even use the printer until you clear the previous print job. So the print job is you processing the full picture of what happened properly so that it can, the, all of that experience can just disseminate back out into life force synergy the way it should, <laughs> instead of being stuck with a process that's half running, but not actually working. So it's kind of like that. And, you know, I also think with dreams, there could be a connection here because do we not also often have dreams where we are somebody else or we're watching somebody else that we can't even remember their face when we wake up and they're going through something really crazy. They're being chased by guys with guns or who knows what. And you're just like watching this happen with the belief that they're going to be okay or hoping that they're going to be okay. Or it's you in the dream. You're inside of this other person and you're making all the right choices and you're jumping over the fences. And I like have these crazy action movie dreams sometimes, you know, <laughs> what if you're, you know, what if your spirit has visited someone else somewhere in the time space continuum who needed extra spiritual energy to make sure that they didn't fall and succumb to panic and that you became the guide to them and you were their spirit guide then. And all you were doing was having a dream. I don't know. Yeah. I think stuff like that could happen. I think that's absolutely happening. I talk, you know, I try to describe, you probably just described it better than I ever do, but I describe to people like I, I know that I do what I call dream work. And I know that a lot of the dreams I have are actual experiences. They're not always for me and they're often for other people and for both of us, really. I mean, I think it goes both ways for sure. Um, but I think that exact type of thing happens. And I think sometimes, you know, I think there are, are plenty of stories we could find of examples of people who are experiencing that in waking life of someone, you know, coming to them or like a presence coming to them and they just knew it was this person or like felt like them and they like got the message and they understood and then the thing went better than it would have otherwise. And, and then they find out that person like had that as a dream. So I think, I think it does happen. I think it's definitely happening. You know, it could even be, I'm just getting far into the speculation here, but <laughs> you know, our, the way we perceive reality is all based on this internal filtration system we've got that could be a cool topic to to consider um how perception really works I, I could get into that a little bit but basically you could be in their in their dream or you your dream is in their reality and you're seeing everything is like zombies chasing you but for them it could be as like they're going to a difficult job interview. Yeah. <laughs> and all you are is just lending some spiritual energy and you needed this interesting plot for you to be <laughs> invested in it, to like put your care into this vessel. But for them, it's like maybe more mundane. Who knows? Like there could be some weird, because some of the dreams we have obviously don't seem realistically possible, but what you are at that point, if you are visiting another person, you would just be sort of like a disembodied spirit. So you wouldn't be accessing the same physical world 3d sense input system that they've got you would just be getting the raw energy of the moment of the total universe fractal and so you would have to like well how can i put that into a story and you're putting it into your own story does that make sense it like, makes absolute sense to me yes yeah. this is i think that <laughs> i can't prove this but i think that our pineal gland is actually the only like, I think our imagination is actually the only sense that there is. Hmm. There's just imagination. And then imagination is the, the input of the divine source, if you will, of the present moment, eternal 
self-existent reality, truth or God. And it's, I, here's why I think this, our ears are closer to the part of our brain that processes our experience of reality than our eyes are. Our toes are way farther away, but yet you could slap your foot on the ground and hear the sound at the same second that you felt the feeling of your foot touching the floor. Hmm. Right. Right. Is there some switch point inside yourself that get, grabs these out of sync sensory inputs and then congeals them into the moment for you? Or is there just one sense and one moment and it sends that data to different parts of your body as projectors that give you a different part or aspect of being able to interpret the energy of that moment? You see the reverse here? Because I think we all believe that me touching the desk is sending a signal to my brain and then I'm feeling that feeling. But what if your source, your innermost core is constantly generating images and energies and then your structure, your biological tech is just like a big filtration system that separates and divides and chops up that signal into a bunch of different, a myriad of all expressions of the same one thing. Yes. So that you can have a way to comprehend it so that you can look for patterns in it so that you can feel the feeling of I am and not just be a pure white light void. And this, I think this is what the game we're in. I think we're doing it this way because otherwise we're just in a womb forever. We either we're either in the egg or we are dreaming of ourself inside the egg. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't know. It's, I, I this is kind of where I'm at with perception, though. I think that, I, like I said, I can't prove it, but I think that we're getting it all in our in here, in our, in our core, and then we're the one that our, our biology is what's making it feel like a bunch of different diverse senses. But like we said before, light is actually sound. Sound is actually light. Smells are actually light. Yeah. Everything's actually light. Everything. <laughs> so in that sense, we've already proven what I'm saying is true. There's actually just one light, and then a big infinite wheel of ways to divide it in a spectrum of uh, possible expressions or perceptions or feelings. Which is why it's fractals all the way down, because no matter where you zoom in or zoom out, you're going to end up seeing the same exact thing. I think that's absolutely right, because this explains also why, I mean, I've never thought about it in that way. And that's such a cool, that's such a cool perspective. And I love it. But it explains so much like, um, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was, but wasn't that long ago where I walked into this room where I'm sitting right now and there's a fan and a light combo or whatever. And, you know, the light switch has to be on and the thing has to be pulled for the light to go on or whatever. And so I walked in and, and this is just one example of like many times this has happened in my life. And maybe you have some you want to share too, but I, you know, I walked up to the light and I pulled it and the light came on. And then I thought, huh, I didn't turn on the wall switch and the light went off. And I was like, what the fuck? And I went over and the light switch hadn't been on. And when I turned it on, then the light came on. I was like, well, it turned on because I knew for sure it was going to, right? Like I had no doubt in my mind that when I pulled that switch, the light was going to go on. And so it did. But once I realized, oh, I did that out of order, it like undid itself. It was all in my head, but it actually happened in reality, right? <laughs> See, what's, what's skillful is that you remembered that anomaly. Because a lot of times for our whole life, little anomalies like that will happen. And we'll just be like, just like that didn't happen. That didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've had. I'm going to put that in my memory palace because it doesn't, it, doesn't it conflicts work. too much with everything else in there. Because it's too much responsibility then. Because then you're like, well, now I could go around doing anything. <laughs> like, but I, I'm not there yet. Right. But I've had that realization that like, if I truly believed and I knew without a doubt that something was true, then it would be true because that's how it works there is no spoon <laughs> it's true i had and people you know that one's harder to explain away but i i used to do that for like a week for some reason i just did this because and it's funny because it was happening because i was distracted enough same with that right i knew the light was going to turn on because i was actually thinking about something completely different i just knew the light was going to turn on but if i hadn't been distracted and had been like i'm gonna turn this on with my mind i don't know if i could have done that probably not um, but I also had a couple times where I 
went to the gas station, you know, this is totally pay before you pump times, you know, not, not back when I was a kid when you could just pump and then pay, but like, since then you like have to pay first to pump. And I just got out and just started pumping, got in my car and drove away. And like 20 minutes later, I'm like, I didn't pay for that. I have a full tank of gas now. <laughs> like I did not pay for that. And it happened a couple different times, you know, and other people are like, oh, someone accidentally paid for you or someone like left there. And I'm like, how, how would that even work? You can't like leave your credit card in there permanently. And it just keeps transacting. Like that's not how that works either. You know, but I yeah, my we have to explain things away. Back in the day, I had a friend that seemed to be able to get into any place, any show for free huh. by believing that nobody was going to notice him going in without going through the gate. And it worked. And it worked. And he was just like, but, but he was a really good guy. Like he, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, not, not uh, otherwise like out to steal stuff or whatever. I don't know. It seemed to work for him. I think at a certain point it stopped working, but no, it reminds me of cartoons where a, the character runs off the cliff. Yeah. They're still running in midair. And then like three seconds later, they realize they're in midair and they're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> and then they fall. Yeah. But, or the Hitchhiker's Guide series. I love it. Uh, my favorite book in that series is So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. <laughs> and that's the book where the main character, Arthur, learns how to fly. I but forget. the way he learns how to, f yeah, it's amazing. He can literally fly. The way he learns how to fly is by uh, being so panicked and running for his life and tripping and falling that he was too distracted and he forgot to fall. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah he was like that. oh that's the secret you have to uh you have to trip but forget to fall and then you will just then you'll be flying and once you're in the flow of flying you're you're doing it so just stay in that zone just keep just don't remember to fall <laughs> i love it so much i think it's exactly like that i just again i think um part of why like you were saying we would like push that out of our memory or like tell ourselves a story of like, Oh no, it was that someone paid for my gas and that's why I got it. It wasn't anything, but that is, um, is again, because we, it's a lot of responsibility to then understand. If you understand that, I think you have to admit that every single aspect of everything you've ever said or done or experienced or has been like done to you or anything was all literally your creation. Right. And I think that part of the cosmic giggle too, is that there always has to be, that little room for it to maybe not have been magic. Like may, someone could have prepaid on that pump and yeah. not pay, actually got the gas or whatever. There's like, usually with anything so-called paranormal experience, there's always like the medium could be making it up. The, True. you know, there could be sleight of hand for some reason, that element of there might be trickery that that doubt and uncertainty is actually quite powerful which is why maybe thinking we know stuff isn't as helpful as it could be uh, made out to be by, by so many. I think that it's just as important to understand the power of belief and wield that consciously than it is to be like, I never believe anything. I'm a pure skeptic. Yeah. I, I only know things when I know things. And look, you definitely would want to practice what you think you know based on experience but yeah being open and having room for doubt doesn't make you like less uh it's actually good i think that we can go too far with doubt and skepticism too because uh, someone could cut themselves off from having like a far out experience with a crystal if they refuse to be open to it so there's like a it's like the ultimate yin and yang here is the straddling the line between knowing and belief. And so maybe we should even just call knowing accepting, you know, I accept that this is what it is right now. And we'll leave knowing to just what we can absolutely know. And we're saying like, we're both kind of shying away from absolutes, but there's one absolute and guess what? There can only be one. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it the absolute. Is it that it's what people call God, but it's reality itself. The self-existent life force energy that perpetually self-regenerates in every present moment eternally equals the absolute. Nothing else is absolute. That's the only thing that's capital T truth, period. So like that's your truth meter. 
as well. <laughs> that's funny. That's actually the definition I gave for uh, in a philosophy class where they asked us like write down the, write down what truth is, and mine was like, well, it's something that is always going to be that no matter what in every state from now until eternity and that it could never be changed it never could be like whatever whatever and they were like well that doesn't exist i'm like well it does <laughs> but it's it, that gone. doesn't exist uh, actually existence is what that is yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're saying tr that doesn't exist but you're denying ex the existence of existence therefore right <laughs> yeah, the only truth is existence there's no other way to define it i really think that's crucial because if we if we're stuck in the role of truth seeker forever it's because we never defined what truth was so how can you find the truth if it's not defined <laughs> <laughs> and the only way to, i mean obviously when you really talk about defining the absolute it's like the the dao the dao that can be explained or described is not the dao that's true these are descriptions but even with yeah like language should be descriptive not definitive yeah. in general like that will help us with our our belief versus knowing thing but the uh the description can be accurate you can i think you can have an accurate description without the words themselves being the thing you know so it's true that that which you call the Tao isn't the Tao, and the description i gave of what the truth is the words themselves aren't it the truth and they could be misunderstood. So there's no way that they could be themselves the absolute truth. But if you see the moon that my fingers are pointing at because of the words, then you get it. Then yeah. you get, then you see the truth too. It's kind of like the Bible. The Bible is not the truth. The Bible is not absolute truth, but it points you to the truth if you realize that you're not meant to be looking at it, but past it at what it's pointing at. Yeah. At the, uh, <laughs> Because Jehovah uh, actually meant that exact thing, the uh, verb of the eternal self-perpetuated reality of existence and life force energy itself. That's what it was uh, supposed to mean. You're the one who told me that and blew my mind because it makes way too much sense. And it's like, and I, I think I said that to you in this episode we just recorded on your show is that that is what I've always meant when I said God. <laughs> so it makes yeah. perfect sense. And I think that's part of what you're describing too. Like we know it's true and we understand it. And the, the words have worked if what just happened to me can happen. Or if you can like see it in your mind and feel it and like, oh yeah, that's it. Like, well, now it's been effective. <laughs> yeah, that's what Jehovah was supposed to mean. But then you get, if you just say that, people are like, oh, well now he's a Christian or... <laughs> He worships uh, the Demiurge because Jehovah's the Demiurge. I'm just like, no, <laughs> no, Jehovah's not meant to be a character. It's not meant to be a noun. It's not a person, place, or thing. Yeah. But I'm not attached to the word Jehovah. So think what you want about it. But it's a, it's, it's actually maybe not that useful of a word because of all the baggage it's got. But the, actually, the Tetragrammaton itself is pretty fascinating. It's when you break down the numerical journey that's within it it does make sense why i mean pr pronunciation being correct or not why yad he vah he in kabbalistic terms means exactly what i'm saying which is the eternal self-existence of nature and reality because let's see where does it start uh what's yad is a five right he is a six uh let's see yad he vah he right no, no, the, the five is the second and the fourth one. So yeah, there's it starts with a 10, right? Yoda's Yod, 10, I'm sorry. Okay. Then it splits into the first five. So it's 10, five, six, five. 10 becomes the two fives, and then the six is what's in between them, which is the generative principle. So and the two fives are, are the, the two poles, right? Right. The male and the female, and then the six is the generative principle. So you get, that's how you go from the, the unity of the 10 to the division into the, the male and female poles with the uh, generative principle between them, the six being between the five and the six. Six sounds like sex, and it's two threes, it's two complete trinities. There's like it, numerology wow. will definitely shed light on why six has to do with generation. But even that word is meant to be, encompass the fact that the totality or the pleroma of everything, the 10, is uh itself then it, it splits itself into two yeah that it, that mitosis and then there's an, a generation between that division 
that's it's meant to tell you that that's actually why there's like a, an apparently dualistic creation that we're in because that's actually the configuration required for there to be this dance of electricity this journey that we're on and not just be in the tin and then that what that also means is that the uh the god and the devil would have to be the same thing mm -hmm. it's the two sides that it split of itself i mean we're talking about the absolute being 10 well how else can you say 10 satan satan <laughs> say 10 that's funny say 10 <laughs> it's 10 i mean even i i there's so you can find this everywhere if you start digging into etymology and spiritual traditions from anywhere in the world like when i just came up with from uh, the hungarian ancient hungarian pantheon of gods their chief god was called isten spelled i s t e n is 10 that was their chief god wow so wow. <laughs> it's a, it's everywhere and 10 has encoded in it all of the um all of the aspects of like the undergirding code of reality, the zero and the one, the binary the code. The hole in the pole. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the genitals. Something and nothing. The when genitalia. you really get to the core of the archetypes or like the deepest aspect of the mother and father of all things, you get to genitals. It's zero and one. The woman <laughs> yeah. is the zero and the man is the one. The woman is the womb and the emptiness and the man is the directive energy that goes into it and Together, they create Put something output. new. What's really fascinating, too, is that 10565 five, Yahweh code is like, um, you know, what you describe, but it's also got the waveform in it, like a 565, five, um, and it has, which is everything, right? Or it's like is and isn't, and the polarity is what, like, creates the movement that that is everything we experience. But it also has a connection to um, this idea that is going to come out in an episode that I'm going to release in a couple weeks that I just did with this Gnostic um, prioress. And she was talking about how, you know, six, the number six, so the number three, I'll just say it really briefly, and then we probably will like try to draw things to a close, but you'll get more of it in that episode. But and maybe you understand it, and you can say something about it. But basically that a woman is three. And a man can't really be a three without a woman. Uh, and so a woman, uh, when she can be her whole threeness in like one and be balanced in that, can offer that energy to a man who can take it in and like complete that. And together that is the six and they can both then create not a human child, which is the other thing that we can create physically, but this new thing which kind of goes back to that idea like maybe we're not necessarily trying to like transcend and get out of this realm but maybe we're trying to create something else that's like beyond the source that we came from or different from the source we can recreate we came from or something like that it's this whole like mystery i'm sort of always like wandering around and trying to understand i think the purpose of life is just life so yeah you're creating new life it's going to have novelty to it because it's an expression of something that's infinite because life is infinite. I don't think there's beginnings or ends to any of this. I think it just is, but that will be a very interesting episode. And yeah. another fun little thing about, <clears throat> since we're looking at the numbers here, people might already be aware of this, but uh, 10, five, six, five, it adds up to 26, which has been in numerology associated with God. Really? And yeah. And if you actually add up, let me make sure that I'm accurate about this with my calculator, but I'm pretty sure if you add up the numerical value of the letters G O D yeah, it's 26 because uh, ah. G G is seven. O is 15. D is four. That equals 26. Wow. And that's the, the same as adding up 10, five, six, five. And if you reduce it further, it's eight, which is infinity. Exactly. <laughs> it's infinity turned on its side. It's so funny. It definitely is. It is. It's got that wave. <laughs> And then it goes back to the beginning. Wow. Well, this has been so much fun as always. And I am sure we will connect again and do more shows together in the future. And, um, but I do want you to share where people can support you and find Interverse. And, you know, if there's anything else you have going on that you want to share or anything like that. Yeah, I've got a website, interversepodcast.com. Go there. There's links to everything that I do on there. And uh, including some great shows with Lindsay on the Cyber Terror, which if you missed those, they are some really deep, <laughs> deep rad. examinations. So cool. 
And that was how we got to know each other. So, well, sort of. Now we've gotten to have more actual just hangout talks. We're going to definitely do more in the future, I'm sure. You can support me currently on Patreon. I'm looking into Rockfin and Subscribestar because Patreon just keeps getting more and more squirrely Mm -hmm. with other people that are bigger than my channel. But for now, I'd love your support on Patreon. I had somebody email me that they were canceling their Patreon membership because Patreon's evil. And I mean, that's paraphrasing. And my response was like, yeah, you're right. They are. Right. <laughs> but you're hurting me 450 and you're hurting Patreon 50 yeah. cents. You know, so I don't know if that's a well-placed bullet that might be more friendly fire than enemy targets hit there. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, do what you got to do. I'd love people's support on Patreon. You get the second hour of the show if you subscribe there. I'm definitely going to be experimenting with new types of content beyond just the weekly two hour show going forward, kind of smoothed out my process and it's quicker than it used to be. And uh, want to engage with the tribe more. You inspire me a lot in that way, Lindsay, you're so good at your community Thank side you. of things. <laughs> and I'm going to be catching up to you on that as best I can. <laughs> I mentioned being the lone wolf, but help me out. Help me stop lone wolfing it, everybody out there. I mean, I know you're listening, but Hit me up on the Discord. That's a good way to connect. That's linked on the website. We have some great chats happening in there with like-minded seekers. And uh, to talk about somebody else that I'm really into really quick, I think everyone should be looking at videos from John Levi. Yeah. I love this dude. So awesome. J-O-N-L-E-V-I. My biggest, we didn't even touch on this, but my biggest area of fascination right now is the uh, old world structures and the question of where they came from and did the people who were told build them actually build them and uh, what kind of antiqua tech might there have been and I've been deeply exploring this I even found the the university I went to uh, before I was even slightly diet woke has these six giant ionic Greek style pillars in the middle of the quad the main part of campus Wow! huge ancient super weathered pillars and the story is that the town was founded in like 1820 or something. And within 20 years, they built a giant Greco Roman pillar based super structure for their college. That, Cause you know, in the early 1800s, within 20 years of founding a town, you definitely need a, a, a university with yeah. amazing old world <laughs> architecture. Right. <laughs> and then they happened to build about 18. So the story is they built about 18 more buildings like that in the area over the next 20 years, which is quite impressive. And then of course the original one though, that had these crazy columns accidentally burned down in a fire and all that's left is the amazing old columns. Every time. And you're like- So everywhere you look, there's these fires and these old structures that the story of where they came from is like, really? They did that with horses and no roads? Wow. Yeah. So (laughs) it's fascinating. I think our potential is suppressed by our belief that we came from the dirt in the mud and i mean maybe there was a time where the mud was everywhere right <laughs> but uh because of mud floods maybe but i think our potential is and it usually has been expressed to a much higher degree and we are in a very weird time right now of believing in this uniformitarianist uh progression of history that that we're definitely way better than our ancestors I'm not i'm not so sure about that I'm I'm in total agreement, and uh, we could do a whole episode on that too. It'd be really fun because I love that, and I love the I love the idea that a lot of these structures were possibly you know sound healing devices in themselves, or or some sort of energy like you know modifying, amplifying whatever devices, so that you could like make crops grow maybe really well or heal people or all that kind of stuff. And I love John Le- is it Levi or Levi? Whatever he's amazing. I pronounce it Levi. Levi. He's- J-O-N-L-E-V-I, 20-minute-ish videos, really bite-sized. Just dive into some random videos of his and keep going because you need to see the pile is the piles and mountains of evidence. You need to see more than just like, because he's he'll make inferences that I don't even think he's on about. Yeah. I love him, but I don't think everything's like, maybe this is this. And I'm just like, no, I don't think so. But that's the one point of a mountain of points of overall, there's definitely fuckery going on with history yeah. big time i'm totally i'm totally with you yeah they're not every single thing but he's really good he's really good at drawing together all sorts of stuff and plus i just love his 
personality and attitude and i i want him to come on rogue way so bad but i cannot figure out how to make that happen so if anybody out me there either yeah if you do let me know <laughs> totally yeah I'm if anybody so, out there I can so hook us up hook us up yeah if you know john levi which i don't think that's his real name but yeah have his email or something tell him we absolutely love him yes yes <laughs> <laughs> well, even i would even team up with you if you only wanted yeah, to do one show that'd be rad i'm having to do that with howdy by the way oh yeah a little too busy with his move to get as many interviews out, so I'm teaming up with, uh, you know, John Coleman. No, you'd like that guy. He's a pedagogy guy. He's all about cool. exploring the best ways to teach. Yeah. Uh, John Coleman. Cool. Uh, ask me about him. I'll link you to him. Okay. You'd like him. You're also a teacher. Yeah, That'd be someone good for your show That'd for sure. Super cool. Well, awesome. This has been great. Obviously, we're gonna do it again. And I always like to give people a chance. If you have like a final message or thought that you want to leave people with. Uh, I got nothing. <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to, I wanted to throw everyone for a curveball. and <laughs> Be like, I don't know what to say. Hey, you've uh, given but... us plenty. So <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Now, my final thought is support Lindsay. She is awesome. And we also need your voices out there, whether it's just with your friends and family or getting brave and making some videos. Like, don't think about how big your reach is. Think about how big your reach to one person would be. And realize also, like, you'll never know if you started in the journey that we're on now, what kind of impact you're having. Most people are silent appreciators. And so don't let the haters slow you down doing your flow thing, because actually, the majority of the universe that's witnessing you is always cheering you on. And the ones that aren't are actually there as you're like, they're your sparring partner in the dojo. So it's like actually going to help you. Well said fellow travelers of the path it is a beautiful thing and this has been your analog electric concentric dose of wisdom according to the master chance garden chance thank you so much your show interverse is amazing i hope everyone checks it out and i'm so glad we got to talk today it was my honor thank you the time templates we are handed as a construct are not those that serve us best when we force our infinite souls into this tiny space and then force our infinite minds into those narrow and linear wagon ruts, we can find the endlessness of self to such withering constraints that we can hardly hope to reach out, reach up, and reconnect. And when we truly glimpse the divine and experience something beyond ourselves, we see that there was truly never anything linear about us, and that anything that told us so was made of illusion. Linear time is the only way to experience material reality here, and so it's useful, but we are not only matter. So it is our task to remember how to experience non-linear movement as well. Our souls can travel in any direction in space and time, our minds are not constrained by anything but our own beliefs, and we can manifest and create a more perfect union of the four bodies of self when we remember to let go of those limitations. And until we remember how to move to anywhere and anywhere, travel well, aim for balance, and always look inside first. Mwah. I heard the Freemasons called you. Man, they at it again. Huh. And I'm out to tell the truth once more. That's right. It's on the cracking, unknown in the house. Hey, P-O-G-Z. That's right. Hitting Let the stereo know. near you. Truth is the best you know? thing. And it's so, on. Okay. Uh. Yo, I once thought that I wanted to get them on track, but to something more bigger than that, that. something lurking. Right off the map, a hidden agenda related to September. Doves carved up on the wall next to the highway. Up in the concrete, rubble rolling home next to where I stay. Which states destruction, like Key Martin malfunction. While Norad's in a mountain anticipating our next move. My heart's jumping and I'm like, fuck, waiting. While cricket taxes are burning a hole in my pocket. With a dollar bill in the pyramid that's watching. Instead of having a capstone on top of it, they have an eye with a fast surprise. While you're flossing it, greedy niggas jocking it. Politics plotting it, so who you vote for really doesn't mean shit. So save your energy from being drained by the enemy. Soul and bones of Freemasonry, envisioning dreams of them chasing me. Soul and bones of Freemasonry, envisioning dreams of them chasing me.
Skull and bones of Freemasonry, secret agencies with a plan to dominate all of man. All of man. Check the records of DIA, strange murals and paintings similar to the ones next to the highway. highway. With pyramids and flames underneath them looking like they're about to fly away. I can't be tripping, but it sounds like I'm on acid. Most people slipping, taken below DIA held captive in the near future where they won't hesitate to reinstate new laws for a bigger cause. I'm talking about establishing civilian concentration camps Introducing the military's labor programs Expand your mind just a little bit Forget the little shit Before you witness the belittlement of your people Expand your mind just a little bit Forget the little shit Before you witness the belittlement of your people Pay attention to the truth The script that he's spitting is true Pay attention to what's going on Or it might happen to you When it's happening to a cellular communication monitor Behavior studied and controlled through chemicals bombing the nerves This murder Jesus ain't got anything to do with the religious cynic Where experiments cage and lace and turn of accepting limits, things I can't explain to this guy when I'm in the Rockies. Chakra systems limited due to the voltage overhead pop. Mind control victims slap clips and machine guns for recess. FCC will help us speak less, manipulate us through weak feel right now. Fiction with the CIA trying to kill me, filthy. Talking about the underground facility at DIA, no one feel that place laced with hints. Notice whenever I return home, lack some references in a new world Masonic capstone. Employ in Area 51 work is the build, and I don't mean to rant. In the face of an emergency, it doubles as a FEMA camp. The reaction solution Trickery repeated through history. No rads listening in using technology, tracking where you piss on my paranoid or just facing the fact. Better watch what you say, it's another day under the Patriot Act. Extend your mind just a little bit, forget the little shit before you win this up a little bit. Extend your mind just a little bit, forget the little shit before you win this up a little bit of your people. The idea is to, the idea is to bring people to the point where they are helpless, passive, and unable to assert their own creative power to form anything else. like this is measured in terms of money which they then translate into power. Corruption and violations of the Constitution. Secret societies, the push for one world government. I'd like to get corruption and violations of the Constitution. The idea is to bring people to the point where they are helpless, passive, and unable to uh, assert their own creative power to form anything else.